Science is not an instant machine for figuring things out. It takes some time. It takes overcoming natural human tendencies, not to expect the world to be the way you think it ought to be. And that was the problem of Vulcan. The thing I most love about the planet Vulcan is that it both was and wasn't there. You know, there are prevailing currents in scientific ideas, and it's very hard to see what's there when you already know to such a powerful certainty what should be there. The search for Vulcan begins in 1859. That was when a man named Urbain Jean-Joseph Le Verrier, who was world famous as the discoverer of the planet Neptune, by looking at Uranus, seeing there was some extra motion that they couldn't explain by the tug of Saturn or Jupiter or what have you, and said, ah, there's another body out there pulling on it. That's how Neptune was discovered. So the same argument was made for Mercury. Planet Mercury moves around its orbit, and like every planet, it isn't a perfect ellipse. It wobbles a bit. Based on the prevailing theory of gravity at the time, we know that wobbles are caused by different chunks of mass pulling on each other. There seems to be some extra mass out there, go find it. And the really striking thing about this story is that almost as soon as people started looking for it, they started finding it. They looked at eclipses and they saw these little dots of light where they thought, you know, there were no stars around. And they did this over and over again. And all of a sudden, the solar system had a new planet in it that was supposed to lurk inside Mercury's orbit closer to the sun, the planet Vulcan. Only problem was, it wasn't true. It was never there. I think there's a lot of stories in physics like the Vulcan story. A lot of times, it takes a while for the community to figure out how to go forward in the right direction. So the problem is, you know, we're human and we have bias, and so we all always have an idea of what's going to happen. I'm an experimental particle physicist. There's a lot of physics that's not included in particle physics. Uh, anything to do with matter, things, <laughs> like stuff, <laughs> we don't do that. We do forces between tiny particles moving almost at the speed of light. So a lot of what we do is to push the limits of measurement so we can rule out ideas about the world. And sometimes those ruling out of things challenge our general theories of the world. The theory that predicted Vulcan, Isaac Newton's theory of gravity, had been used by people for 150 years at that point with great success. And the reason they were so easily convinced they saw Vulcan is because of the power of the idea of Vulcan. It was so hard for people to see beyond that compelling idea, to really interpret, to really understand what it was the evidence of their senses and their instruments were actually seeing. But after about 20 years, these repeated sightings were never reconfirmed, never survived calculations of their predicted orbits. And it's striking to me that it was Albert Einstein who finally brought Vulcan down. You know, there was no solution but to come up with a new theory. Albert Einstein was very near the end of working out his greatest accomplishment, the general theory of relativity. But in his last few weeks of figuring this out, he tries to see if his new theory, almost finished, almost right, can it reproduce mathematically the observed orbit of the planet Mercury. And it did. And that really was the end of Vulcan. So I think that the, the story about the search for Vulcan could be similar to what's happening right now in our search for dark matter. There's astronomical observations of the velocity of, of stars in the galaxy that lead us to believe that 20% of the universe is made out of matter that doesn't interact with light. But we don't know what the dark matter is, so we're imagining that it's particles, some kind of particles, and we're looking for them. And there's lots of experiments uh, looking for dark matter. There's, I mean, there's looking for dark matter with telescopes, looking for dark matter at my experiment in proton-proton collisions. Just a huge amount of effort in finding dark matter particles. 
Now it's possible that we're just not thinking in the right way about this, and like Vulcan, there aren't dark matter particles. It could be that, it, that it's something else, it's some different way, you know, like a new Einstein will come and say, oh, actually, you know, it's, I don't know, I can't even imagine what it could be, but it's something else. And in the end, it won't be bad that we've looked. I think in, in many ways, the essence of scientific thinking, what it means to think like a scientist, is understanding that there are many, many more ways to be wrong than you can imagine. Nature can fool you, the world can fool you, your desires can fool you. Lots of things can trick you into thinking something is so when it's not, or isn't true when it is. Nature is more deceptive, nature is more concealing uh, than we like to believe. I don't know what people who aren't scientists think about science, <laughs> but I hope that they realize it's a living, breathing thing and you can make mistakes and you can make big jumps forward and things change, you know, whereas we once thought this, now we think that. And that it's not because we're silly, it's because we're actually learning things. And the good news is that we eventually figure stuff out.